it's our the poet's duty in a way uh, to uh, to use language in order to throw light on the devious way in which language is used by politicians. Oh, boy, you see, yeah. to to not only take us for a ride, not only sell us down the river, not bankrupt us morally, but literally lay waste the planet. So this is how angry I am. And I've made statements, anti-Bush statements all over the place. So I would have to say, uh, the, after speaking about ferrying secrets, that is the deeper dimension of poetry. Now there is another aspect, aspect to it, which is continuous with it, and it is in fact made possible by the deeper dimension. And this is what I would call engaged poetics. Did you say poetics? I said poetics, but let me come down from the ivory tower and just call it engaged poetry. Like Thich Nhat Hanh, he calls himself Thay Nhat Hanh, the Greek mm -hmm. Vietnamese Buddhist monk, sure. uh, who speaks about engaged Buddhism. Okay. So let me talk about engaged poetry. Well, in a way, the concept of engaged poetry is a redundancy, because I want to make the argument that poetry is fundamentally and by definition engaged. So I don't have to say it's engaged poetry. <laughs> but why do I say it? It's because I don't have confidence in my culture, this culture, that has been rendered superficial by runaway materialist consumerism at the cost of the rest of the world, I might add. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the confidence in the culture to actually know what poetry is. So I have to spell it out and say it's engaged poetry. So well, engaged poetry, then people say, ah, you mean it's political poetry? And I would say, yeah, if you would like to see it that way. I've already told you that poetry is fundamentally political. But yes, call it political poetry. And what do you talk about in political poetry? Well, it's an it's a, it's, it's a arena within which we use language as a, a pugilist or a boxer might, might use his fists. So poetry, poetry has the power, in a way, uh, to score direct hits. It's, we would love to hold on to our notion that uh, the poet is the, the, the legislator of the world, is uh, sh sh the Shelley thought. But uh, we might also want to think of the poet as the breaker of idols, as the, as the one who engages in what I would like to call a demolition derby. <laughs> you know, you know. I'm liking that. <laughs> no, no let, let's let's wear our, let's take off our helmets and and get into a demolition derby. That's Maybe we better put them about. on if we're going in a demolition derby. Let's, let's be like Stephen Crane and be his man who was pulling out his heart out out of his chest and eating it in the desert. Let's let's be that person. That's why you know one of the. Um, Part of what I've been involved in is a uh, weekly meeting at Curly's Diner. Mm -hmm. What night of the week and what time is that for pe meet, people meet, watching? We meet at, uh, on Tuesdays starting at about 7.30. It's totally open to everybody. People walk off the street. And where is Curly's Diner? Curly's Diner is uh, just off of Washington Boulevard. It's between Atlantic and Washington Boulevard. Okay, in downtown Stanford. And Curly's Diner from the 1930s has become a place of resistance because the empire, the big guys, the corporations, are trying to take it down so that they can put asphalt all over and erect big glass buildings, right? But Curly's, which is run by these two courageous Greek sisters, is not moving uh, because it's a people's place, right? So we've been meeting there for years now. It's totally open. People come off the street and uh, do rap, and we do all sorts of poetry there. Um, and we have published three books. And 
the first book that we published is called Eating Our Hearts Out. It just now occurred to me when I invoked uh, the sh shade of Stephen Crane and uh, the man who relished the bitter taste of his own heart sitting in the desert. It occurred to me that I may have subconsciously drawn on that in coming up with a title for this book called Eating Our Hearts Out. Yeah. Now that's engaged poetry. That poetry is not simply an exploration of private sensibility and a, uh, this country is chock full of poets who are extraordinary at doing that. And you know, there's a part of me that's a great admirer of poets who are word wielders and who do it exquisitely. But it's an exploration of private sensibility. Unlike the great poets of Eastern Europe and, and other in Vietnam and Cambodia and Africa and so on, who have actually had to face uh, utter breakdown. But I want to say that places like Curley's and there are other places like that are witness to the fact that one does not have to be in places of war and devastation to understand what breakdown is, what loss is, what disenfranchisement is. Okay, we have it in our own neighborhoods. And we don't have to go to our inner cities. We can go to the neurotic heart of suburban America to know what breakdown is and what capitalism is doing in terms of absolutely eviscerating our spirits, you see, and leaving us bankrupt imaginatively, morally, spiritually, uh, and so on. That is why Engaged Poetry, and the second book that we published at Curley's is called, uh, it was actually reading against the fence, because Curley's Diner was fenced in by the Redevelopment Corporations. And uh, the book was called Beyond the Fence, and then we have a third volume called Wednesdays at Curley's. We used to have our meeting meetings on Wednesdays. Yeah. Um, all of this stuff uh, falls under the category of engaged poetry, that redundancy, because the poets are basically pouring their hearts out 